Exactly at 2 last p.m., we are sitting on the same tree trunk that Hocker collapsed on to catch his breath yesterday at 6 like p.m., now unmerciful hunger and thirst register. We have not had anything to eat or drink for 22 hours. Dull, tired, hungry, thirsty, and with soaking clothes on our bodies, the three of us sit, forsaken by God and the world, in a French forest from whose trees the water drips down our necks with the slightest breeze. Rage, slowly but surely, rises in us. In addition, we are surrounded by the enemy but we still struggle to keep the vague hope that for well-trained soldiers it will not be too difficult to get out of this encirclement. We forget that now, 1944, after more than four years of war, we have become weaker while the others have grown stronger. If we had only left Soissons with the SS. Hocker opens the round. If we had only gone to a respectable unit in Paris, Brilla joins in. If this shitty war had only stayed with the devil, I add my two cents worth. Restlessly, I get up and wander in a circle around my two companions, whereby I stumble upon the remains of the equipment and supplies left by the men from our battalion. Out of sheer boredom, I turn over with my feet the helmets, belts and cartridge pouches until I come to the bread sack, which I pick up and examine curiously. Well, well, I groan and pull a piece of Swiss cheese out of the bag. Sauntering toward my friends, I see their expectant faces looking at me. Then I feel something crawling on my hand, holding the cheese, and I quickly look to see what is there. Angrily, I shake my hand vigorously without letting go of the cheese and twenty ants that were hanging on it fall to the ground. The last one I brush off with a branch torn from a tree. Then I hurry proudly to my companions. So I hold the cheese in front of their hungry eyes. Isn't that something? It weighs at least three hundred grams with the holes. Hocker laughs and reaches for the cheese as a red-brown ant crawls out of one of the holes. Do these beasts also eat cheese? Brilla asks, observing the animal. No, Hocker jokes in response. They don't eat it. We will. Finally, a laugh comes back to our serious faces as Hocker cuts the cheese into three pieces. It will give the stomach something to do, Brilla indicates, and struggling with the entire mass, shoves it into his mouth all at once. With a mighty effort, he swallows the entire gluey clod as his eyes bulge out like those of a frog. Dirt grub, he spits out as his tongue makes a half circle between his cheeks, lips and teeth, while we struggle to suppress our laughter. Don't laugh, you dirty sacks, he growls angrily. Come on, old man, I nudge him. What will the madame do when we appear? Perhaps she has something that you can wash your mouth with. You don't want to go down to the village, do you? He jumps up with a jolt. Hocker looks at me, upset. That is exactly what I want to do, at least to the edge of the village, so that we can finally see what is going on there, I answer determined. Or don't you want to go over the road toward Leon? I follow up. Of course I want to do that, but it is still daylight, Brilla counters. Then let's at least go far enough so that we can see the village and the vehicles, I demand dauntlessly. Without further dispute, we go into the underbrush so we can slip down the slope. Just as we reach a point where we can see the church and some of the roofs of the village, the bells in the village begin to clang. Loud shouts in the village streets are sure proof that Soissons is free of Germans. Liberté pour Franet, bellow a pair of children's voices as the bells become silent. This time we are really in deep, Hocker mumbles angrily. Tonight we will look up the madam, Brilla says gruffly. We will learn from her where the Americans are, he adds. She will turn us in, I warn. We lie in the thick underbrush and await nightfall. Calmly and attentive to everything, we glide quietly down the rest of the hill and a little later stand in complete darkness before a high park wall that we follow to the left until it makes a right turn into the village. Carefully, we work our way to the first houses and discover double guards with long, fixed bayonets on the village streets. They are French, I murmur to my comrades. Shall we try it further to the west or east? Brilla asks. Eastward comes from our mouths at the same time. Then about face, Brilla whispers, and I am now in the lead. Quickly, we make our way over the small meadow that is nestled between the village and the woods, 
and after thirty minutes reach the eastern limits of the village. We recognise the frame of our burned-out ammunition truck. But even there further eastward, French men stand smoking together with weapons on their shoulders. The French are in front and in back of us. Inch by inch we make our way slowly through the meadow, then past a guard standing on the road. I do not have the slightest fear of the French, but to be in the situation with the Russians would seize me with terror. Brilla approaches me from behind. Just keep going, Robert. I will watch out for the Frenchman, I say softly in his ear. It is 1.35am when we stand up north of the railroad tracks and joyfully stride out in a northeast direction toward Lyon, which lies about 25 miles in the distance. August 1944, for an hour and a half, we march unmolested across the fields, keeping Soissons to our right so that we can cross the railroad line headed north. We later observe human shadows on the horizon above the railroad grade. They move here and there in typical American carelessness. Robbed of all hope, we let ourselves fall exhausted into the grass and stare into the heavens, from which comes no advice or means of escape. Further northward, I say without any power in my voice, it is certainly hopeless, my companions answer. Then we must try and get some civilian clothes and see if we can go on during the day, I answer. Where will you get civilian clothes, they ask. What about the Madame Brilla? I nudge him. She just wants a man in bed and not to help anyone who is trying to flee, he snaps, depressed. Then I will try it, I say, and sit upright. If one goes, we all go, they both respond. OK, then let's go back again to the village, I say, filled with new courage, and stand up quickly. Silently we retrace our steps. Exhausted, we stop close to one of the houses standing along the street near the main road of traffic. We fall into a thin clump of bushes and are immediately asleep. A bright day greets us as we awake. The sun burns hot in the sky. Looking toward the street, we are amazed at the convoys of Americans that roll eastward uninterrupted. How are we going to get across this road? Hocker flusters in shock. They won't be travelling forever, Brilla responds confidently. It is already nine o'clock, I indicate with a laugh. Time does not matter any more. Hocker reacts. Brooding, we lie again on our backs and blink into the sun. About ten o'clock, the traffic on the road suddenly stops. Not one human being is to be seen in the entire area. Let's go, men. Brilla forces a grin and stands up. Get ready to die, Hocker indicates. Boldly, we step into the road, our pistols ready. We make our way through small, unfenced gardens, across the village street unseen, and follow the park wall into the woods, where we stretch out next to a pond covered with magnificent water lilies. We are now aware of the improbability of our luck, but also the carelessness of our conduct during the entire war. Unusual situations demand unusual decisions. As we discuss whether or not to test our lucky streak by knocking on the madam's door during the day, since it appears that the entire village is in Soissons celebrating the victory, our doom approaches in the figure of a stone-faced old Frenchman. He bends around the shrubs in front of the pond and begins in all quietness to pick the water lilies without even a glance around the area. Unable to move because the old man would notice us, we wait, hoping that he will soon disappear as quietly as he arrived. But suddenly he slides on the slick bank, falls onto his back, grabs the grass with his hands and stares directly at us. Oh, soldat allemand, he screams like he is insane, and with his last ounce of strength slides back away from the water's edge. He stares at us with open mouth and immediately screams in a shrill, crackling voice. La guerre finie, American soldatici, liberté franaise, soldat allemand part. Shut your damn mouth, Brille screams, going straight toward him and seizing him in his arms. Irresolutely, we stand around the old timer who, shaking with fear, begins to scream again. What shall we do with the old boy? Brilla asks, puzzled. Stick his head under the water until he becomes peaceful, Hocker says, reaching into the man's pockets and pulling out matches in his hand. Quickly, we light our cigarettes. As fast as his legs will carry him, the grandpa uses this instant to gallop back toward the village, screaming all the way. 
We follow him quickly and grab him by his jacket. He stops running and whimpering, he moans. C'est la guerre. Yes, this is war, old man. Hocker hisses at him. Undecided as to what we should do with this shaggy Frenchman, fate takes the unpleasant task out of our hands. Five Frenchmen come toward us on a fast run, their attention having been drawn to us by the old man's screams. The five men hold their rifles to our breasts. Give up, one of them calls to us in good German. The Americans have been in Leon for some time. Slowly we lower our pistols. The spokesman comes to us walking calmly. With outstretched hand he demands our weapons. Instead we put the pistols back into our holsters. We are not at war with France, I say, looking him in the eyes. Laughing, he pulls a pack of American cigarettes out of his pants pocket and hangs one between his lips in typical French style. You are lucky, he says, still laughing and holding a burning match to his cigarette. I was a prisoner in Germany, he begins in a calm voice, and I cannot complain about the treatment. You could have easily fallen into the hands of some fanatics who would have shot you without mercy. You can keep your weapons if you will follow me into the village where I will turn you over to the Americans. You are certainly part of the people who rested here a few days ago and did not cause any trouble. Give up, the war is over for you and you will see your homeland again. We look at each other. We will not surrender to the French, I whisper to my friends and notice that one of the riflemen has disappeared back toward the village. Let's run into the underbrush on the left and shoot it out with these guys. Hocker murmurs through his teeth. An unrealistic situation rushes through my consciousness, and I am in doubt whether I am awake or dreaming. Unexpectedly, four Americans the size of trees appear from around the corner, shaking with fear and excitement. They remain about five yards distant from Use, standing with their automatic pistols pointed at Use. Hands up, boys, one of them calls and as in a vision I see everything that is dear and precious to me disappearing in an unending distance. The most disgraceful moment of my long life as a soldier has arrived. Here in this lousy French village, it has come as unworthy conclusion. Raise your paws in a double German salute, Helmut, Brilla says loudly next to me. Just now I notice that my friends are holding their open hands in front of their chests. Without direction from my absent spirit, I slowly raise my hands toward the sky. From the time I was wounded on July 4th, 1944, at La Haye du Puy, until my release from the hospital in Auxerre on August 10th, the American forces made significant advances. My division, the 77th Grenadiers, was part of the 450,000-man German 7th Army, which during the first two months of fighting after the Normandy invasion, lost 160,000 men killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. The 77th Division was wiped out at the Battle of the Falaise Gap in fighting during the month between my wounding and subsequent release from the hospital with orders to report to Paris for assignment. I opted to take an assignment with an emergency battalion under the command of Captain Nolte, composed, in part, of remnants from the 77th Division. Under Nolte, me and the others were to occupy Le Bourget, a few miles northeast of Paris, and would presumably engage the enemy when it launched its attack on Paris. Hocker, me and Brille, arrived in Le Bourget on August 16th, the same day Chartres, with its famous medieval cathedral, fell to American forces and the day before Orléans was taken. The retreating German army was in no position to take up the defence of Paris, and when me and my comrades left Le Bourget on August 19th, American forces had reached Monte Gassicourt on the Seine, 30 miles west of Paris, and French resistance fighters had begun open operations against the Germans in Paris. Four days later, August 23rd, French resistance fighters had Paris under control, and on August 25th, French and American troops rolled into Paris. Despite some pockets of resistance from the nearly 20,000 Germans still in the city, Paris was free. Compared with the fighting in other cities, the Allied casualties were light. Only 628 Americans were killed, while the Germans lost 3,000 killed with 10,000 taken prisoner. While Americans and French celebrated the liberation of Paris on August 25th, 60 miles to the east in Soissons, 
Brillé, Hocker, me and the others were enjoying our last wild night with the French civilians of that city. The next day, August 26th, we were overtaken by units of the US 7th Corps under Major General Collins, pushing northeast 25 miles from Chateau Thierry. The 7th Corps took Soissons on August 29th. While I give August 28th as the day of my capture, it is possible that I lost track of one day, since my prisoner of war tag indicates that I was captured at 11 a.m. on August 29, 1944, in the vicinity of Soissons. I was correct in considering it hopeless to try and escape to the south, the direction the 7th Corps had come, and as we made our way north around Soissons, trying to cross the Aisne and reach Lyon, we were cut off by the 7th Corps, which continued its rapid advance through Soissons to take Laon on August 30th. While I had no clear picture of what was happening as me and my unit sought to outrun the Americans, I knew that the Aisne River, just north of Soissons, might pose some barrier to the advancing Americans. If we could cross the river, our chances of escape were much greater. But the rapid mechanised American advance meant that once the foot soldiers were overtaken, there was little hope of pushing on ahead of the American troops. The Seventh Corps continued to push northeast after taking Léon, and by September 3rd had cleared most of the army's zone south of the Belgian border. Birth August 1944, the tyres of the jeep squeal sharply and raise an ugly cloud of smoke as they negotiate a left turn on the street going out of the village headed toward the main road. My two comrades, sitting to my right and left, clamp like iron onto my arms. No, I do not dream. I am sitting on the wide hood of an American army jeep between my two companions and travelling back along our road of retreat to where we came from. Turning myself around, I see the disapproving faces of the American soldiers and the threatening manner in which they point their pistols at us. Once again, a feeling of inner emptiness and infinite abandonment creeps over me. I try to bring some order to my thoughts while I stare at my field blouse, robbed of all decorations and badges. Where my national insignia was sewn, there is now a hole through which the white of my undershirt can be seen. On my left wrist is a band of white flesh, where a short time ago my wrist watch kept the skin from becoming tanned. Only my shaving kit remains. Pull yourself together, Helmut, I hear Brilla saying from what seems like a far distance. Shut up, barks an American behind us over the windshield. Kiss my ass, growls Brilla, and spits contemptuously onto the right side of the road. The motor of the jeep hums monotonously as it distances us further from our intended goal with each passing minute. The thought comes, why didn't I put a bullet into my head? What purpose is there to living without freedom, especially now after the world in which I believed, for which I fought and bled, has collapsed? Who are these people, who, like highway bandits with no feeling of shame, plunder soldiers in their most bitter hour and enrich themselves in the most base manner on the misfortune of others? What will happen to us? What must the homeland face if these Americans are successful in pushing into the Reich? Like a strong stimulant, these thoughts make the blood flow hot from my heart through the veins and create a new determination in every pore of my body. In full possession of my old spirit for life, I grab the hands of my friends and press them vigorously in the hope that they will also overcome this humiliation. A fine smile on their mask-like faces thanks me for the gesture. A warm stream of inner joy pulsates throughout me with the certainty that I do not have to carry the coming misery alone. A quiet oath seals in me my readiness to stand by them in their highest hour of need. It is true that today we have fallen into the hands of robbers, but the fair fight in Normandy brings the conclusion that not all Americans are such miserable highway men as these. The fact that they have a sense of humour was proven during an episode that occurred near Saint-Sauveur. At that time, some Germans fell into their hands, including an 18-year-old who had the face of a child. After a quick decision, they cut his pants off above the knee, filled his pack with chocolate, hung a sign around his neck that read, We do not fight children and sent him back across no man's land to his unit. It will be a hard loaf of bread that the future gives us, but the belief and hope that we will once again see our homeland shall shine for us, like a star in the darkest night and together.
we will endure what fate has prepared for us. The driver cuts the motor and turns left onto a field road where fifteen tanks are assembled along the length of the meadow. The jeep stops by the tanks. With grinning faces, the troops pull us from the jeep. Helpless, the three of us stand in the middle of these foreign soldiers and let their mockery pass over us. The four rascals to whom we surrendered our weapons show the others our decorations, which they pull from their pockets. A tall American examines our medals and insignias with interest. On the sleeves of his wind jacket are three raised stripes and two lowered stripes, which indicate that he is a staff sergeant, the same rank as we. With unconcealed admiration, he walks up to us and pats us on the shoulder. Good soldiers, he says, acknowledging us, and calls in incomprehensible English to the four soldiers who are busy examining the contents of our map cases. They respond by shaking their heads. Energetically, he turns from us and steps among the group of curious who are examining our equipment. A hail of words shoots from his mouth upon the soldiers, to which one replies in the same intensity and tone. We listen, surprised, to the terrible gibberish, recognising that a fight is looming over our medals. With the painful feeling in our breasts that we are witnesses to, and the cause of a strange family strife, we follow the spectacle that these farmer sons from the United States are carrying out. A pudgy older Yankee comes out from a tent situated between the tanks and goes toward the arguing soldiers. On his cap and on the corners of his shirt collar are two metal bars which identify him as an officer. After a few sharp words directed toward the soldiers, the rabble becomes silent. With a stone-faced expression, he now comes toward us and remains standing three paces away. His grey eyes wander from one to another. Taking an enormous cigar from his pouch, he shoves nearly half of it into his mouth. From the pockets of his jacket, he pulls a match in complete calmness and then with a quick strike against the low-hanging pistol holster lights the match. Leisurely, he guides the burning match to the cigar and seconds later an impressive smoke cloud rings toward the sky. Staring at us with an unchanging face, he calls several men to him with a snap of the fingers. Without taking the monstrous cigar out of his mouth, he talks to the soldiers in a deep voice. Their grim faces promise nothing good for us. In the next moment we are encircled by the Americans and feel their searching hands on all parts of our bodies. The entire contents of our pockets, including our wallets, fly before our eyes. Dirty fingers sort through our possessions and take all money and photographs with military objects from our wallets. Bitterly I see the picture of my wife disappear into the pocket of a dirty thief. Unmoved, the officer follows the shameless activity of his subordinates. Finally, they are finished and indicate we can pick up the lamentable remains of our possessions. A small truck built like a jeep, pulls out of the group of parked trucks with a howling engine and stops next to us. Five heavily armed Americans help us into the vehicle. They climb into the wagon after us and with their bodies block the open back end of the truck. Driving quickly, we travel back along the field way to the main road and after 15 minutes turn left onto a small paved street and stop suddenly in front of a large farm complex. Our guards spring elegantly from the truck and indicate with spiteful gestures that we are to do the same. In stoic calmness, we leave the vehicle, unimpressed by the conduct of the Americans, and march towards six Frenchmen standing in front of the gate to the farmyard, with German rifles and pistols in their hands. They break out in a war cry when they see us. Under the idiotic roar of these failures from 1940, we are driven through the entrance to the yard and stand next to each other with our faces toward the house wall. Yeah, do it quickly, you murderers, I think, expecting to get a bullet in the back of the neck. In seconds my previous life passes through my consciousness, but the seemingly endless minutes pass without anything happening until an unseen man calls Brilla's name in German. Present, I hear Brilla answer indifferently. Come inside the other one registers again. I glance to the left in the direction from which the voice comes. Unruffled, Brilla leaves the wall and saunters through the open door of a shed toward a standing American. 
Almost politely, the man leads him in through the door. They are going to interrogate us, I whisper softly to Hocker, and as a consequence I receive a hard, painful blow to my right kidney, which takes my breath away and immediately silences me. Calmly and ready to meet with dignity whatever comes, I glue my hands to the wall and stare with hanging head at my boots until Brilla, after nearly an eternity, is returned to us and my name is clearly called. Don't give them anything, I hear Brilla hiss, as I march like an unfeeling robot to the soldier at the door. The guard leads me through the door into some kind of a carpenter shop which is set up as a temporary office. At a long table, sitting with his back to the door, is a massive being whose insignia indicates that he is a high-ranking officer. The guard shoves me in front of him. In military form, I salute him with my hand on the corner of my cap and notice how the man across from me studies me critically. Bored, he thanks me for the salute and leans back comfortably in his chair while one of the four men in the room serves him a cup of heavenly-smelling coffee and a plate with bread and corned beef. Exerting all of the control at my disposal, I force my eyes from the splendours before me, which I assume are there to tempt me. I observe immediately his suddenly wide-awake look and wonder what his purpose is. Disappointed, he reaches for his cigarettes, throws one leg across another, and turns to me in exaggerated friendliness. Since July 20th, the Nazi salute has been required in the German army. Why is it that you salute me with the old military salute? My tactfulness forbids me from using this salute of honour on an enemy officer, I answer with a firm voice. So, he acts surprised. Then you possess more tact than your Minister of Foreign Affairs, von Ribbentrop. Do you know that during one of his visits to the English king, he greeted him with Heil Führer? I am not aware of that. I give indifferently in response. It is the truth. He underscores his words and reaches for the coffee cup. How long have you gone without anything to eat? He turns to me and continues the conversation. For two days, I explain shortly. Oh, then you must be terribly hungry. We will hurry so that we can get you something good to eat, he says to me in a concerned manner. I am not going to fall for that, I say to myself, although a terrible feeling of hunger rages in my insides. But the voice of the officer interrupts my thoughts. Your unit, please, he asks and reaches for paper and a pen. Here is my Soldbuch, mister. I answer calmly and finger my Soldbuch out of my wallet. Curiously, he goes through the pages and gives it back to me. How is it that you have just now been captured? Your division was destroyed long ago, he asks. I was in a hospital, I explained to him. So, that's why, he indicates, satisfied. But after that, you were in a rocket launcher company. Where is it now? I was not in a rocket launching company, I return his assertion. But this is a record of your troop strength and ammunition stock, he declares sharply, and holds an old roster in front of my eyes that was in my pack. Naturally, that is from La Haye du Puy. I laugh at him. Don't lie, he bellows angrily in response. We have the means to make you talk, you can count on that. Here is my sold book, everything that I know, and that would be of interest to you is in it, mister. Otherwise I do not have anything else to give you, I say to him with deliberate calmness. I will give you the opportunity to consider it once again in quiet, he says, somewhat cooled, giving one of the men present the sign to take me away. Prepared for any meanness, I go in front of the guard out the door, where another receives me, leads me across the yard, and shoves me into an enclosed pigsty. The gate slams shut behind me. In the half-dark, I look at my new quarters and confirm to my satisfaction that the boars that were housed here before me were removed days ago, and because of the excessive heat the straw is at least dry. Since it is impossible for me to stand up in the small stall, I shovel some straw into a corner and sink down upon it. It's too bad that I don't have any matches with me in order to smoke one of the few cigarettes that I still possess. What did the American officer mean with his crazy talk about rocket launchers? I only saw those weapons in action once in Russia. That was on October 2nd, 1941, near Vyazma. Damn it, those were the days. 
Squeaking, the door to the pigsty opens and bright sunshine floods my dungeon. From the perspective of a frog, I see the brown leggings covering the shoes and olive-green pants of an American. Come out, you Nazi pig, he calls in bended position into my quiet little chamber and grins from ear to ear. Dumb dog, I think, and slip outside. Blinded by the glaring light, I hold my hand for protection in front of my eyes as the guard takes me by the arm and guides me to the officer. Have you considered the situation? he asks and looks at me cynically. In connection with the matter, there is nothing to reconsider, I answer him honestly. Shall I put matchsticks under your fingernails like the Gestapo does to the Jews? he snaps threateningly. That will not make a rocket launcher out of me. I did not have anything to do with it. I answer him obstinately. What is this written by your own hand? He holds the list under my nose once again and points with a pencil to the signature on the backside of my old ammunition report. Mortar ammunition, I say dryly. And here, he points to the end of the list. 996 mortar grenades, I read to him. So he laughs triumphantly and folds the list together. They are rocket launchers. Isn't that true? No, just mortar grenades, eight centimetre mortar grenades, mister. I laugh in his face at the error. Why didn't you say that at first? He becomes angry and throws the pencil to the table. You didn't ask me about it, I answer calmly. Get this fellow out of my sight. He speaks German in a rage, puffing on a cigarette. Apparently happy about the failure of his superior, an older American, grey at the temples, turns to me, and behind the back of the officer gives me a sign which seems to mean, let's leave the fool. I salute, turn on my heels, and follow him. With the feeling that I have won a battle of wits against the officer, and that I have avoided a medieval torture, I step to the side of the somehow sympathetic older soldier, out into the open and across the yard, where he puts me into a shed. To my great surprise, there are about thirty German soldiers there, including Hocker and Brilla. A quick glimpse into the individual faces of the prisoners is enough to know that, unfortunately, I am not acquainted with any of the others. The shed does not have a door and is completely open in front, apparently having served the farmer as a coach house. As a consequence, two American soldiers stand several paces distant, observing us sharply and chewing with empty mouths in a manner that reminds me of cows ruminating in a meadow. They are chewing gum, a non-commissioned officer explains to me in response to my question about why they are continually chewing. What did they want from you, Helmut? Hocker asks, concerned. They thought I was the leader of a rocket launcher unit, and that's why they locked you up in the pigsty? Brilla asks in amazement. It wasn't that bad. If it doesn't get any worse, we can be satisfied, I answer him tranquilly. Hopefully we will soon get something to eat. Otherwise I'll die, Hocker mumbles to himself. What time is it? I ask, looking at the other Germans. A while ago it was 3 yard p.m. according to the American's watch, the non-commissioned officer informs me. Where are you from, comrade? I ask. From Neustadt. He sighs, depressed. That is not too far distant from my home, I say lightly. But unfortunately, no longer can it be reached from here. The train has already departed, he indicates without humour, then continues. We should have gone to the railroad station earlier, comrade. This morning they pulled me out of the arms of my girlfriend. The French must have betrayed me. Where did they catch you? I ask, interested. Naturally, in Soissons, I could have held out for a long time with this voluptuous prostitute. She had food in abundance, let me tell you. Then it was about time that the Americans saved you. Otherwise, you would have had to serve at her court of love for a long time, I tease him. Not so long, we will be home by Christmas, he indicates, convinced. Do you believe that Führer will finally put into service his legendary secret weapon? I ask, hopefully. Führer and secret weapons don't make me laugh, he responds contemptuously. No, the Americans will win the war and make us their 49th state, then see how well we live. So, that's it. I whistle through my teeth and turn away from him. 
My friends look at me with sad eyes. Do not let such idiots bother you, they whisper to me. It is unbelievable what kind of fools we have among us, I fluster back, shaking my head in disappointment. How about smoking? I ask my companions. Both shrug their shoulders. Why don't we try it? I say, taking out my cigarettes to offer them to my friends. Embarrassed, we ransack our pockets for matches while the guards watch. Regretfully, we display our empty hands to each other. Without interfering, one of the guards steps toward us and in a friendly gesture holds a burning lighter to our cigarettes. With a deep drag, we pull the long mist smoke into our lungs and nod our thanks to the foreign soldier, who acknowledges it as he returns to his position. There are both good and bad among them, I conclude. Those two seem to be in order. Hocker seems to read my thoughts, if they would just give us something to eat. Be a little patient, Willie. We will surely be fed soon. The interrogation officer knows that I have not had anything to eat for two days. I comfort Hocker while my own terrible hunger torments me. That is what I told him as well. He now laughs, causing me to lose faith. Did you tell that fellow that you belong to an alarm battalion? Brilla asks, interested. No, I was ashamed to utter the name of this heap, and he did not ask at all, I answer softly. We simply lay down our sold books in front of him, and there was nothing entered in them. He already knew about our old division, and so he did not ask any questions about it, Brilla explains to me. That's clear, I say. The outcome has been decided and they are no longer interested. I add my commentary. In the meantime, rain clouds gather, and the first drops drizzle onto the hot stone pavement in the yard, causing steam to rise. The poplar trees standing nearby begin to sway in the increasing wind. Our guards are relieved. Two others, covered in raincoats with small, rapid-fire weapons and ammunition belts, take the same places and stare at us, apparently in a bad mood. The soft hum of motors in the sky draws our attention. As the noise grows louder, our trained ears distinguish the familiar sound of the ME-109, which has been spread over all the battlefields of this war. Like a bolt of lightning out of the bright sky, it screams almost vertically out of a cloud bank, firing tracer ammunition into an American fighter plane below it. The American pilot guides the badly wounded metal bird upward as a black, ever-increasing stream of smoke pours out of the plane's engine. The ME-109 rushes over the farm at a low altitude and disappears in an elegant turn before the enemy anti-aircraft guns can fire at it. At the same time, as the American machine climbs toward the sky, a dark bundle falls toward Earth until a white parachute unfolds and gently brings the pilot back to Earth. The plane, now free of its pilot, wavers drunkenly in the sky for a few seconds and then, as though smashed by a gigantic fist, explodes in a mighty ball of flame and is scattered by the winds. We look with happy eyes at each other. Once again, we are permitted to see war as we have known it. Only slowly does the awkwardness of our own situation return to our consciousness. Instinctively, I feel the eyes of the American guard resting on me and turn around looking up at him. A faint smile can be seen in his face, and the wink of his eye indicates his recognition of the German pilot. These guys are fair, Hocker whispers to Brilla and me. I would like to know that for sure, I say, and dig out my cigarettes. Once again, we squeeze the cigarettes between our lips and look inquiringly toward the Americans. A sergeant pushes his way to us on the outer edge of the shed, from whose roof the rainwater trickles out in silvery drops from the leaky rain gutters. He tries to give us a light with his wet matches. The guards follow his vain attempts with interest. Finale, when they make themselves understood, one of them steps toward use and holds, his burning lighter to our cigarettes. No good, German matches, the sergeant babbles trustingly, but the American merely shrugs his shoulders and returns to his place. You old fool! I hiss angrily at him. For your entire life, you have lit fires with German matches, and suddenly now, in the eyes of the Americans, they are no good. Do you believe you can improve your own circumstances with this stupid prattle? I am convinced that every clear-thinking opponent has nothing but contempt for one who soils his own nest. 
What would you have thought of a Russian prisoner in a similar situation who chattered about his matches, which functioned fine in dry conditions, and which he used just a short time before to light a cigarette while standing behind his machine gun to defend his land? Once again, I turn in disgust away from this characterless scamp, who, without a word of response to my accusations, slips back into the dark shed and mixes with the other Germans. We will have a lot of trouble in the future with our dear comrades if they continue to act this way. I bow my face in shame. I would have liked to bust him in the nose, but we cannot show the Americans such conduct if they are to have any respect for us, Hocker cracks, just as angry. We must hold out and watch out for ourselves. Otherwise, we will sink in our grief. Brilla calms us with a warning just as the noise of a truck's engine in the back of the yard drowns out his last words. Now, for sure, there will be something for us to eat, Hocker suggests, and all the men behind us become unruly like cows in a stall that can smell their feed. Only two men at a time, a tall American call standing on the tailgate of the truck holding up two fingers. The truck is completely empty and the bed is freshly washed. Go ahead the tall American indicates as we hesitate in front of the empty vehicle and look to Brilla. Quickly we grab onto the sides and climb up, and Brilla as the next follows. Happy to be together, we forget our disappointment and are already curious about where they will take us. Certainly there we will get something to eat since it is at least 6 corn p.m. In no time the truck is completely occupied by German soldiers. The last to get on are three SS men with badly torn uniforms and swollen faces. The Americans chase them angrily back into the shed and slam the tailgate of the truck closed with one hand. Three powerful Americans armed with pistols make their way through the crowd and climb onto the truck. Slowly the vehicle begins to move with its sorrowful freight, reaches the main road in a few minutes and starts to roll westward with accelerating speed. After about 30 minutes' travel time, we see five American tanks encircled on the other side of the road, close to the edge of a nearby wood. In the middle of the circle, we recognise about 300 Germans crouching on the ground. Slowly our vehicle turns onto a field road and rumbles toward the tanks. Our captured comrades look at us curiously as the truck stops and we are told to get out. Line up in two rows, we are ordered by an excited and unbelievably fat American whose shape brings us to laughter. Macht schnell, he screams angrily, as he notices that we have very little respect for him. That fellow has eaten way too much for us to take him seriously. I chuckle in high spirits to those around me, and they in turn break out in laughter. We quickly form in two rows, in the firm hope that we will finally get something to eat. Once again, the three of us stand in the front row and look for provisions, but none are to be seen. Instead, two Americans without weapons stand three steps away from us, and upon a signal from the fat one begin going through our pockets. Afterward, we are driven through a line of cynically grinning Americans where a couple of US soldiers, armed with red lacquered clubs, urge us to sit down. Don't they give you anything to eat here, is my first question to the unknown fellow sufferers next to me. No, only the club. If you don't make yourself small and ugly, an older corporal answers. That can be bad for us, Hocker indicates, sad and downbeaten. Do you know when we will be sent on? I ask the corporal. Not today for sure, he answers, resigned to his fate and lying on his back in the wet grass. Luckily, the rain has stopped. We smoke without speaking. How long will we still have some? I will make an inventory. I interrupt my friends, lost in their gloomy thoughts, and lay out the rest of my possessions between my widespread legs. A letter case with diary. Four small photographs of my wife and me in Strasbourg. A list of my belongings in our apartment at home. The marching orders from Paris to Le Bourget. A telegram from my wife in which she reports the bomb damage our apartment had suffered. My sold buch, a handkerchief, a full pen and a pencil stump. 31 German cigarettes, the wedding ring on my finger, my shaving kit with a razor and 20 blades, a half-used bar of soap, shaving brush, a can of shaving cream, and a little bottle of aftershave lotion. You came away very good, the corporal indicates as I shove my riches back into my bag. 
It's not the end yet, Brilla throws in. How many cigarettes do we have together? I ask my friends, reporting my 31 cigarettes. I have 23, Brilla announces, and I have 44, Hocker laughs proudly. Then together we have 98 cigarettes, I conclude. The corporal shall receive eight of them so that he can also smoke, I note, handing him five, to which Hocker also adds another five, so that he has ten. The good Hocker laughs generously. Many thanks, the man says, suppressing a little emotion. Gradually the night descends upon us. Only the glowing points on the tanks indicate the location of the Americans. Before I starve to death here, I'm going to take off, Hocker whispers with a determined expression. We would not get past the tanks alive, Willie. I try to talk him out of his insane intention. Impossible. Brilla agrees with me, and as proof, a tank machine gun peppers its tracer ammunition into the woods. At least let us sleep in peace, you gangster, a man bellows out of the middle of our group, upset about the noise of the machine guns. We are hungry, someone suddenly yells courageously. Whoever mutinies will be shot, an American responds in a powerful voice from where the tanks are located, causing a brooding silence to lie over the captive soldiers. Overcome with fatigue and weak from hunger, we fall into a restless sleep on the cold, wet earth. August 1944 After I awake from a terrible sleep, the first thing my eyes behold is the leaden grey sky. Tormented by absurd dreams, I need considerable time to find my way back to reality. I look at my surroundings, my entire body shaking from the wet and cold. Mist and thin fog clouds lie over the prisoners pressed tightly together. Here and there someone tries to warm himself through deep knee bends or running in place. The American guards stand on the ground and sit on the tanks wrapped in their warm brown coats with glimmering yellow-gold brass buttons, their automatic weapons ready. A gnawing hunger rages in my empty stomach. Sleep still holds my two companions in its compassionate hands while my thoughts wander homewards. Now the field mail service, which previously invisibly connected the front to the homeland, has been torn in two. Weeks will pass before my family will be informed by way of Geneva of my fate. Many days and nights of uncertainty will wear on them as they wonder about me. An immense longing seizes me and brings me to my feet. With numbed legs, I wander along the edge of the assembly area to restore some feeling to my limbs, to organise my thoughts and to set myself in order. Since 1940, I have seen countless soldiers of the opposing nations fall into German captivity. Their fate was certainly no less difficult than mine. I estimate that since the war began, over a million German soldiers have come under foreign custody in such places as Africa and Stalingrad. I cannot consider myself so important, especially not now, although a terrible hunger depresses me, and all of the meanness and humiliation that I have recently experienced threatens to drive me to the edge of doubt. A number of situations that I have fallen into during the course of the war seemed hopeless and brought me to a confrontation with death. But still, to this day, fate has been kind to me and has provided a way out in every situation. The time in prison will also pass, perhaps earlier than I think. It depends completely on me if and how I come through it. I recall the saying I learned at my confirmation, which has accompanied me throughout my entire life. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes be pleased with my way. Good, we will see why I had to become a prisoner at this time. They will not allow us to starve. Otherwise they would have executed us on the spot and saved the trouble of transporting and guarding us. A prisoner is ballast for the enemy, if not an immediate danger. We require guards and provisions. The first are missing at the front, and provisions are dependent upon the supply convoys. Therefore we are not really as useless as I had previously thought. And then there are my two friends that luckily I became acquainted with while we were still free. Perhaps Providence has arranged it this way. During my wandering, I come unexpectedly upon a group of German staff officers sitting on the edge of the camp area. Even a general staff officer with a red stripe on his trousers is among them. Amazed, I remain standing, looking at the gentlemen who still wear their medals. 
It is a mystery to me how these high-ranking officers, who must have known about the situation at the front, could have been captured. Or did they come to the Americans out of free choice? In the hospital I heard rumours about such officers. I think he is crazy, I hear an older major say to the others. Slowly I turn around and look at one of the tanks while my ears intensely take in the officer's conversation. He did not listen to Rommel or Rundstedt. Instead he just ordered a vigorous defence without allowing himself to get a correct picture of the situation, one of the men among them says with a sullen voice. You could not expect anything better from a corporal, another throws in. And I don't understand Keitel, who must be informed about everything and still accepts Führer's orders. He must be one of the first who realised that his Führer is crazy, and still after the 20th of July he announced in all openness his loyalty to him, another indicates in an objective tone. What would you do in his position, when everyone watches every step and spies follow you? the Major asks angrily. We don't know enough about the situation, gentlemen, so we'd better just drop the subject. A clear voice ends the conversation. Deep in thought, I look for my friends, who sit smoking on the ground watching for me. Back from your early morning exercise, they greet me, laughing. I come directly from a section of the division staff and report to you obediently that the Führer is crazy, I answer and sit down among them. Obviously doubting my understanding, they look at me sharply and chuckle to themselves. Have a smoke, Helmut. Hocker tries to distract me by offering me a cigarette while he continues to study my face. I am not crazy, you sleepy heads. I only wanted to move around a bit and came upon a couple of high-ranking German prisoners, whose conversation I indiscreetly heard. I remove from them all doubts about me. Is there really a general here? Brilla asks, becoming curious. No general, but a general staff officer with the rank of colonel, I explain to him and report what I have heard. They always babble about such stupid things, and then they lick the soles of Führer's boots when they receive the knight's cross in their hands. Brilla pushes away the talk about officers. Führer is crazy for them now that he can no longer use them. Hocker spits out contemptuously. Still filled with bitterness, I look toward the wood's edge, from which a group of Americans are coming toward us. When they reach the German staff officer, they stop. After a short exchange of words, the German general staff officer salutes and goes into the centre of the assembly area. Listen up, all of you, he calls with a clear voice. The Americans have just informed me that in half an hour we will be transported from here. They ask, therefore, that as soon as the trucks arrive... We assemble in five rows so that we can be loaded as quickly and easily as possible. We are going to a collection camp in which we will immediately be given something to eat. Nothing will be taken from anyone. By this occasion, I want to ask you personally to keep order and discipline, so that in our present situation we can impress the Americans. Under the more or less loud curses and maledictions of the prisoners, he turns and goes back to his place, where his ego now built up by the Americans, he continues his conversation with the other officers. We want to make sure our cigarettes are secure, Brilla indicates, taking his three packs of cigarettes out of his pants pocket. We follow, likewise, taking all the cigarettes out of the packages and hiding them under the hem of our field blouses. In future searches, I will keep my wedding ring hidden under my tongue. Only my shaving kit which I must carry in my open hands, remains in possible danger. Two Americans, armed with pistols, mount the truck, which is completely loaded with Germans, and hold tight to the wooden stakes used for the canvas covers. Finally, the black drivers slam the doors to the cab shut. With a jeep occupied by four Americans in the lead, slowly the convoy gets underway and reaches the highway. At a speed of about 35 miles an hour, we roll westward through the area recently conquered by the Americans. After half an hour, we make a sharp turn to the south. We speed toward a village lying like a picture of pure peace, snuggled against the edge of the road. In the village are beds and food, restaurants with cool drinks and lusty girls, everything that a soldier longs for, but which is now unattainable for us. Everything inside me strives to believe that this will be possible again. As the lead truck reaches the first houses in the village, it is greeted by the inhabitants standing along the street. 
But all too suddenly, we see the raw reality in the form of rotten tomatoes, rocks and fists raised in threat. In a frenzied rage and with wild, distorted faces, the French show their true faces for the first time in this war and what they really think about us. A hail of dirt and a cannonade of insults crack against us as we pass through this indignant mass of people. How is something like this possible? I grumble to myself as the whole affair is over and we roll through the poorly cultivated fields. You stupid German rube, I admit to myself. You always imagined that they liked you because you were so nice and friendly toward them. Greatly disappointed, I look at my countrymen who, like me, can only shake their heads about the French. I feel that I have been forsaken by God and the world. My stomach cramps together and every nerve is in rebellion. An indescribable feeling of homesickness fills my breast which far exceeds all the bodily pain I have ever known. It is as though I have lost a loved one. But before I can control my feelings, we travel through a small city and experience the same thing. We are lucky that the Americans sitting alongside us point their pistols at the threatening Frenchmen. Otherwise, they would tear us from the trucks and trample us to death. An old, ugly hag with a swelling on her forehead as big as a tennis ball pours her chamber pot out of a window upon the defenceless German prisoners in the vehicle stopped in front of us. A hail of stones, which our comrades had caught from the French, cracks into the window of the old woman, and she immediately clears out, disappearing into the interior of the house. Finally, the convoy continues on. Completely filthy, we escape from this awful town with its miserable people who act in raving madness to shower their hatred on defenceless prisoners. That's the way it is with the Grande Nation, I turn to Brilla. And we must handle them with kid gloves so that we don't hurt their pride, Hocker replies angrily. Just once in my life, I would like to pass through this nest with my machine gun platoon, Brilla thunders, slamming his fist on top of the cab, causing the driver to hit the brakes and then give the truck gas so that the passengers tumble on top of one another like sacks of potatoes. Keep yourself under control, old man, otherwise you will have to get out and go by foot, I joke with my furious friend, who clamps a cigarette between his lips and waits impatiently for a light while another prisoner pulls, with considerable difficulty, a match from his deep coat pocket. Gradually the ride becomes uncomfortable, like animals for the slaughter, we remain squeezed together in a stupor. Finally, the convoy nears Paris, and we begin to prepare for the stormy reception we expect there, when the lead truck takes the road to Saint-Denis, which we reach after half an hour of slow travel. Prepared for everything, we stare at the few passers-by on the streets who hardly notice us at all. The quiet with which the citizens take our arrival seems unreal to us, to my complete surprise, I discover behind the closed window of a house an older man and two girls who wave furtively to us with their handkerchiefs. Not until we exit the city do a couple of young punks and pious hookers, with their repulsive gestures, blur the good impression that Saint-Denis has made upon us. Already, the sun is bowing in the west toward the sea, when, in the vicinity of Chartres, we leave the main road and follow a secondary road to a meadowland surrounded by barbed wire in which about 1,000 German soldiers are enclosed. I notice a water ditch which meanders through the meadows and awakes in me an insane feeling of thirst. Others in the convoy see the water too, causing a dangerous commotion, but the Americans have mastered the situation and have a large number of soldiers armed with clubs to maintain order as the trucks are unloaded and it is only with brute force that they succeed after a few minutes in lining us up in marching order. Again and again, they swing their clubs down on the dried-out bodies of the prisoners, bringing the half-mad men to reason. I am pushed forward by the herd of prisoners, while Brilla's tight grip prevents me from falling to the ground. If we don't get something to eat here, then we will take off tonight, he cracks, full of doubt. Unable to utter another word, Hocker nods with sad eyes his agreement. Finally, the guards open the gate built of tree trunks. Once again, our pockets are searched before we are allowed inside the enclosure. Only the thought of escape gives us the strength to stand upright and patiently allow ourselves to be searched. By now I no longer care what they take from me. 
My eyes see only the canvas bags in the enclosure where the first of our transport are gathered and drinking from the familiar spouts. Even before the searcher's dirty fingers are off me, I push my way forward and under one of the taps of the water container. Greedily I suck the precious water out of the bag like a piglet at the nipples of its mother, and do not move away until Brilla squeezes in next to me. Although my thirst is not satisfied in the least, I look around for Hocker and find him lying on the ground, his strength completely gone. I drag him next to Brilla, who steps aside so that he can get some water. Only now I find the time and the interest to look around the area. The men from my transport lie in a wide circle like they have been mowed down, while a part of our predecessors mount the trucks in order to be transported on further. Still, I feel the urge for water, but it is no longer possible to get to the bags, which are now encircled by a massive ring of thirsty men.